All right. Good morning, everybody. It's good to uh, be with you today. Uh, it's a little, I think it might be warmer outside, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's good to be with you all uh, uh, the same. So as we get started, uh, prayer requests for this day. <laughs> okay, I'll put one in. <laughs> for for me to continue recovery since she's with us today. Yeah. Hey, welcome back, Dita. I rejoice that she's here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. In the flesh. Are you still going to comment online, Vito, or just... <laughs> I noticed Alan communicated with you one day, though, when he was sitting there. I have ways. Yeah. Okay. Prayer. Thanksgiving that Garrett has direction now since he got his appointment. Oh, good. 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 West Point. Good. Yeah. So he'll have to... Behave now. <laughs> Congratulations. Who's that? Garrett. Oh. Um, I talked to Norma Harry the other night. Prayers for Norma and Jim. Um, Jim said he gave up doctors for Lent, so. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's probably a good thing. Prayers of Thanksgiving. Rick and I both got to go into Mom's room and visit with her and hug her and be with her. So that was nice. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. That's always good. Did we pray for Tom Lee yet? Did we say that? How's he doing? Yeah, I talked to Tom uh, and Carol. Was it Monday? Uh, maybe. Uh, so he had surgery last week. He had to have brain surgery. And they removed a mass, and they thought they got it all out, but it did turn out to be malignant. So now he's awaiting a further treatment plan. But he is home, doing well. I mean, I spoke all things considered. So rejoicing that the surgery went well, but then prayers for guidance and peace for all that comes next. Yeah, it was malignant. All right, well. Prayer of Thanksgiving for St. Patrick. Great. <laughs> Seriously, 5th uh, century saint? I, I mean, I, he, he yeah. shared the gospel with the Britons? Right? Is that right? The Britons? You're as the history guy, Rick Reed. No, the Irish. With the Irish. Well, well, I guess, yeah. Well, that would make more sense. We will. Uh, let, let us go ahead and pray. He's Patrick. <laughs> Patrick, missionary to Ireland. There you go. Uh, is, he's one of the best-known missionary saints, born to a Christian family in Britain around the year 389. Some of you remember him. You were, uh, he was captured. He was captured as a teenager by raiders, taken to Ireland, and forced to serve as a herdsman. After six years, he escaped and found his way to a monastery community in France, ordained a bishop, kind of like you. Uh, <laughs> It is believed that Patrick made his way back to Ireland in the summer of 433, and there he spent the rest of his lo long life spreading the gospel and organizing Christian communities. He strongly defended the doctrine of the Holy Trinity in a time when it was not popular to do so. His literary legacy includes his autobiography, Confession, and several prayers and hymns still used in the church today. At least one tradition states that Patrick died in Ireland on March 17th, around the year 466. There you so go. now I, I don't know why I was making him a Briton. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let us pray. Uh, dear Lord Jesus, so we thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, all that you have given us and all that you continue to do for us. Uh, and especially uh, we give you thanks for all the saints that have gone before us, including St. Patrick and the, uh, the work that he did as a missionary and a confessor of the faith. Uh, we come before you with, uh, with many other prayer requests. We pray for uh, Vita and her re continued recovery. Uh, that uh, uh, the uncertainty may be removed, that uh, the next steps would be made clear. Uh, we also pray for Alan as, she continu as he continues to care for her. We lift up to you uh, Larry and Judy, and uh, as they continue to um, have health concerns, uh, pray for their families as well as they continue to care for them. Uh, lift up to you Tom. Uh, we thank you for a successful surgery. Uh, pray that he would also recover well and that uh, what is next would be made clear. Uh, Pray for Jim as he has many health concerns and Norma, is, is, she cares for him. A prayer of thanksgiving for uh, Rick and Shirley being able to see Jenny uh, recently, that uh, the wonderful gift of fellowship and being able to be in person with one another. Uh, we also give you a 
prayer of thanksgiving for Garrett's uh, uh, appointment to West Point. That uh, we thank you that uh, amidst all the uh, confusion with that process, that it is finally clear, and we uh, pray for Garrett that he would uh, do well and that he work hard and that he would be uh, to be able to serve his country well and uh, as he studies at West Point. All these things we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Also, uh, note, note uh, next week, no class because it's spring break. So, You'll safe be travels. Be gone. <coughs> I guess I could call in, uh, yeah, but I won't. All right. Well, uh, so we last week wrapped up uh, the funeral committal service. Now we, uh, or the next, whoever knows how long, um, the Lord knows. The, the Lord knows. We'll, we'll talk uh, also about next steps, because you and I talked the other day about what, what to do well, ne- after this in so, a year or whenever this yeah, is done. So we're going to, for the immediate future, look at a handful of appropriate Bible texts for funeral services. Well, you know inappropriate texts also? <laughs> There's probably a few. Um, okay. Uh, I don't know. I'm just yeah, feeling yeah, yeah. a little, a little frisky. frisky today. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, that's, it started with my eldest daughter uh, this morning. Always ready to give her a life lesson. <laughs> and I don't remember what it was today. I, I stopped. I laid off. I realized she was not in the same uh, highly exercised caffeinated position I was in. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway. she's going to, she, she is just being shaped into such a wonderful young lady. And I can't wait to see all the training that she's been given by me and her mom and Mr. Johnson, when he was her band leader, all that. So, yeah, all of you have shaped her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it will be music to my ears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully a good quote, an appropriate quote not an inappropriate quote speaking of bible though what are we going to do after this so after this then we're going to take a look at hymns and songs uh appropriate um i forgot about that suggestions for uh what was that okay um for uh a funeral service and then after that we'll select a book of the bible we're thinking in a minor prophet um so but that will probably be in six years, so we got plenty. Yeah, of time a minor because a major prophet, we, Christ may return before we finish with a major prophet, yeah, but yeah. a minor. So, so then we, like Zephaniah, perhaps we'll see. Yeah. Then I ask you, is Zephaniah a book of the Bible? Yeah, it is. So. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think either of us know much about the minor prophets, so we'd like to Habakkuk. Dive into, yeah, dive into that a little bit more. So, all right. So uh, looking at your sheet here that I, that I've put together, uh, this is by no means an exhaustive list of Bible verses for funeral services. I pulled these from the Lutheran Service Book Agenda. Uh, it it has a lot more, a ton more, um, but these are kind of the more familiar, more popular, also the more historic uh, Bible verses, Bible passages for uh, Christian funerals. Uh, so again, by no means is this exhaustive. These are just the ones that I. I just kind of selected these ones, and so we'll we'll be working through through these. Uh, we're going to start with uh, the Psalms. Uh, we already spent time when we went through the funeral service itself. Spent time on Psalm 23 and 121, as those are pretty common ones. Um, so today we're going to take a look at Psalm 27. Did you just preach on this last week? I did. I did. That's good. Psalm, See if people were listening. Yeah, Psalm 27. So uh, why don't we go ahead and turn to Psalm 27. So again, uh, in, in, in looking at these passages, I, I want to keep in mind the framework of using these in the context of a funeral service or the committal um, and, and why these would be appropriate, uh, what, what, what they communicate specifically in a situation such as a funeral. So I'll go ahead and read, read this whole psalm and then we'll, we'll dive into it. So Psalm 27 of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? 
When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, Seek my face. My heart says to you, Your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, O you who have been my help. Cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right, so Psalm 27. Uh, anything uh, stand out to you as to why this would be a good psalm for a, a funeral service? Open it up. Well, the first verse, whom shall I fear? Don't even fear death, you know. Yeah. Or what shall I fear? Yeah. I've got marked in my Bible on verse 11, that's a level path for life. For life. Yes, uh, the ways of the Lord are the ways of life. <coughs> Absolutely. Peggy. And verse 4, that is just such a beautiful verse. That's everyone's goal, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Mm -hmm. To dwell in the house of the Lord. All the days of our life, mm -hmm. to gaze upon God's beauty. Other thoughts, Paul. Not to your question, but I. It's interesting listening to you read that and what and reading along in NIV. I think I prefer the NIV in a couple places where it talks about the tent, he'll hide me in the shelter of his tent. Mm. NIV uses tabernacle. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I would think, I personally prefer the idea of tabernacle rather than tent. Tent does nothing. Does it, I, I not understand how they're, yeah. you know, interchanged, but tabernacle sounds, well, I don't know. It's a more, it's more, more religious, I guess. It's a more than just going out camping. Yeah, there's a more specific <laughs> meaning with tabernacle. Yeah. yeah. Then it happens both, both times. Mm -hmm. Then it, it talks about that. <clears throat> In verse 14 would definitely be for, for uh, Pastor Troy. He's one of my favorite pastors. <laughs> Uh, I mean, so, so I, I, the, uh, the wait for the Lord, be strong and let your tar heart take courage, wait for the Lord. We are always waiting. And, and then as we talked about in the Hebrew, that word for wait and hope, like the same thing. Well, yeah, uh, but, but what do you do while you wait? Because I could stew, I could worry, uh, I could resent. Oh, that's a good one. Um, or I can have uh, my, my strength. Our strength is not in ourselves. It's in the Lord. So we can have courage. And then. Boy, in all things. And then we can also just stand firm. And that doesn't mean it may be a fight. It may not be. It may be to, to hug someone who was formerly our enemy. Uh, so, yeah, I think that because that that is the living of life. And then what are we waiting for? We're waiting to die. But on the one hand, we're waiting for Christ to return. Because, because verse 13 says, I will look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And I was wondering, what do you think the goodness of the Lord looks like? I mean, if you had to describe it. Is it a wheel in the sky? It keeps on turning? Who's that? Who sings that song? Wheel. Journey. Journey. Okay. 
That wouldn't have been my favorite Journey song, though. When the lights go down in the city and the sun. No. Small town girl. Small town, okay. Yeah. I guess I think that when that time comes, we'll actually be able to look at the Lord. Nobody ever has been able to look at the Lord, you know? And to be able to look and gaze upon the Lord, that's unimaginable. Well, I, I don't know. Has no one ever been able to look at the Lord? I, I think they have. Moses. David, maybe not. Well, no, Moses. Moses had to look the other way. Yeah. Moses, Moses was blinding. Oh, anybody who saw Jesus looked at the Lord. See, I think yeah, that's it. I, I think it. it's... Uh, I will see Jesus face to face. That That God shows his love, that he comes into his creation in a way that we can absolutely comprehend that, that here is Jesus. Himself. The Father. Jesus. The Father. The Father. The Father. Father. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what the Father looks like. I don't either. <laughs> Jesus said if you have seen him, you have seen the Father. So I don't need to see the Father. I just no. see the Son, yeah. and I've seen it all. Not that they're the same person, but. Yeah, St. Patrick had a lot to say about this. <laughs> yeah. <right>? So, uh, <laughs> Peggy, I think you had your hand up. I did. Um, I had told Pastor Luke last week that um, <laughs> the wee hours of the morning before my mother passed, Pastor Krupski came. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning at the hospital. And he read to her selected verses from Psalm 27. They were, he knew that they were meaningful to me, and, and they were meaningful to him, and but the very last words of scripture that my mother heard were Psalm uh, 27, 14, those last words. Yeah. And, and it was, we were waiting for Jesus to come. Yeah. So it was a beautiful verse and perfect for the time. And it was great. Well, because I think if we have patience. I mean, I'm learning this patience. I don't always have to give my kids a speech. Uh, it's the well it's the same thing that i and, and chad belsner shared it but he didn't get it he, it's the john wooden be quick but don't hurry uh which i understand more and more when i repeat be quick but don't hurry at, at something very basic right now that i pray will go away soon is when we put those gloves on before communion distribution because the more i try to hurry the worse they get and they tear and we have and it's one time chris hinton had a claw hand because he finally just said he, he just worked despite the glove and the more he tried to hurry the worse it got and he and we, we joke about it still about every time but uh not that communion is a joke but but i think it is sometimes if we start to panic and hurry that's when bad things happen. hey if you just can just let's just relax a minute um it, it's going to be okay yeah, right I, I like the way first five is worded, I'm, but I'm reading out of an NIV because I think so many times when we run into problems in our lives or we feel persecuted or, or at a funeral or death or something like that, we try to look for the Lord to deliver us out of the, the temporary trouble. And when I read verse five, for in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high on a rock. If I read that and apply it to my own life, unfortunately, I can find way too many times in my life where that did not happen. He did not keep me safe. The problem went on. He did. So what he's refer, what the writer is referring to, I believe, is faith. He will keep my faith safe. The enemy might be able to cut off my arms, cut off my legs, do all sorts of things. But he can't cut the faith off. And so when it says he will keep me safe in his dwelling, I don't know that I need to look at that and think that that's going to deliver me from a terror right now. And then the other one, he will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle. I take great comfort in knowing that my faith is safe with him and cannot be taken away by the circumstances of the day or by Satan other things may still happen. And I think that when you look at that psalm in that kind of context, too, it helps us understand that I think, it, I think it's talking a lot about faith here, or faith in the promise in this particular case. I, I think you can get really specific. It's talking about Jesus Christ, who said, tear this temple down 
And in three days, I'll build it up again. And so when we say he'll hide me under the cover of his tent in the one who is the rock, who is the, the temple, it's Jesus. And so, look, Christ was put in the tomb, but he's not dead. He's risen. He's alive because I will look upon the Lord in the land of the living, and we are in Christ Jesus. And so we talk about faith. Faith is in Jesus Christ. So I think that's the opportunity we have as Christians also. It's like it's really simple. I think everything does end up back in Christ Jesus, but then how we express that, and as we remind one another that we can stand firm because we are in Jesus, and he's not dead, but it takes faith to believe it because it appears as though it's all going bad. Well, and to, to Paul's point earlier, uh, I mean, John says that Jesus came and tabernacled among us. Like Jesus is right. the tabernacle, the new tabernacle, the new temple that dwelt among uh, human beings. Well, and it's referring, I mean, in the Old Testament, they carried the tent around. I mean, they had the Ark of the Covenant and they would set up the tent and the cloud, the glory cloud, the, what is it called? The Shekinah. I don't know. Sounds sure, right. Sure, yeah. Sounds <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, that God was there, but then, and then they build a temple, but then the temple's torn down, but Christ is the temple. So, yeah, I mean, and, and then, that, I mean, just uh, verse six, my head will be lifted up, my enemy, above all my enemies all around me. I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. Uh, we'll sing and make melody. Like we sing, singing is a gift, and, and singing, uh, whether, it, whether it is recounting the battle that we're still here, uh, but also singing in triumph and hope. Uh, and I was thinking, Rick, as you said about it didn't seem like God always uh, set you or high upon a rock, but you're still here to tell about it. So he has kept you. Uh, you, you may be scarred, but uh, yeah. Well, I think the, uh, as I talked about in, in my sermon last week, that there are changing moods throughout this psalm and like it starts off pretty pretty strong david starts off pretty strong and it's like he's kind of telling himself all these faith statements that he he knows and believes these are i true. learned it in sunday school yes these yeah. are the things i know are true and then he gets to verse seven and it's like he can't hold it in anymore hear O lord when i cry aloud like he knows that god has set him upon a rock but man, he's still got something terrible that he's experiencing right now. And, and so, he's demanding God, listen to me. Yeah. I mean, it's not about dear, dear Lord. He doesn't speak in King James because he speaks Hebrew, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't have to be a great formality to this. Because mm -hmm. that's what I'm wondering. If this, I, I want to make it all about Jesus. You've said, seek my face, your face, Lord, do I seek. Where am I going to seek God or how do I seek God in the face of Jesus Christ? That it is not... Uh, on uh, uh, just on on I was the one hymn on Jewish altars. Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain, something like that, because it's in Christ Jesus. Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. Yeah, we'll be here for four <laughs> weeks. <laughs> no, so, yeah. Yeah, you touch on. We skipped it. Yeah. Um. My um, my husband's grandfather passed away uh, two years ago yesterday. I'm sorry, two years ago on the 13th, four days ago. And um, when he passed away, it was weird because my husband, my my husband's mom, my mother-in-law called, and she said, you know, you guys should come um, because he had been doing like a death rattle all day. And so we came, and then David was there. And he opened his eyes and like looked at the clock, and then he went to heaven or went to his people. And then I read the twenty third psalm over him before the funeral home came, and so I went. I just wanted to say that we all cried. It was, yeah, it was sad but happy. He was good. But not anymore. No. And you know, it's funny because he was one of the people, like, he was one of the hardest working guys, and he never knew he was sick until February. Um, he fell and hurt his leg, and they were like, oh my gosh, you have cancer in your brain, your stomach, your liver, your pancreas, you've not been in pain. And he's like, 
no, like I still go cut grass and do my job every day. <coughs> So, a uh, couple other things from Psalm 27 uh, is that this psalm is bracketed with hope. Uh, the first two verses, or the first verse, uh, it begins with hope. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And then it closes with hope. Um, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. And so it begins and ends with hope. Uh, and then in between these two brackets, uh, there's all the... The living of life. The, yeah. The, the, the testing. The, the, the testing, the mood, the mood shifts, uh, the changes in tone. Uh, the Lord, I believe, help my unbelief um, between the beginning and the end of this psalm. Well, and I think we've probably talked about this before. This is where Martin Luther would talk about oratio, meditatio, tentatio, which is prayer, time in the scriptures, and then the testing or living of life, which pushes us back into more prayer, which continues to shape us. So I think that bracketing, it is the, ex the experience of the person of faith, specifically the Christ follower, that, that we, this is what I know to be true, I'm going to talk to you. You've already said it, God. I'm going to talk to you about it. Then the living of life causes me potentially to question everything. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, but I got to go back to, to you. Because the alternative and where Satan wants us to go is to despair, which is the absence of hope, which is the absence of anything outside of ourselves uh, and is terrible. Well, even, even God's word can cause testing. Now think about what, what you brought up, Rick, uh, verse five, for he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. Uh, if you are going through a hard time and you read that verse, you're like, how is this true? <laughs> Some kind of hiding place. Yeah. You yeah, got, yeah. God. I mean, yeah. This, I mean, this is miserable, whatever it might be. <laughs> and, and so like that, that produces a, a testing or a, a trial or a, uh, the, the German word is infectung. A, uh, you're fancy, man. A, Infect a struggle Infectum, like yeah. God, how is this possible? So there's a trial of faith going on. God's word actually can produ does produce a trial of faith for us. Um, but as you say, that drives us back into prayer, drives us back into God's word, um, all of that. Yeah. In um, verse 7 through 9, where he's really hanging it out there. Yes. You know? um, but then if you can see um, the gradual, I don't know, the, the speaking of the Holy Spirit to him, bringing him back to the truth, the reality um, that God's not going to turn him over to the desire of his foes, which um, or false witnesses, which could be right there. Satan whispering those lies into his ear. And so the Holy Spirit is still is ministering to him there, bringing him back to the truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can kind of get the sense that maybe things are, he's going from a bit of a panic in a lack of trust to things are slowing down as he looks at it and remembers who and whose he is. Uh, but, but it really, I mean, uh, in the, in the one hymn we sang it on, we sang it last week, didn't we? Oh God forsake me not. Uh, yeah. Oh God forsake. Yeah. That wouldn't have been on my top 10 list, but, uh, you didn't ask me and it didn't matter. <laughs> uh, but cause I, cause the part in, in, in our pastoral care companion that we use a lot of times, pastoral visits, it leaves out definitely verse 10, I think 11. Um, but it really gets very specific. My father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. And, and I think, I'm pretty sure in the Gospels, Jesus himself even, and this is where, as Bonhoeffer would say, David prays the Psalms, Christ prays the Psalms, we pray the Psalm. Jesus is living this out also when he says, who is my family? Who are my brothers? It's, it's those who, what, what does he say? The, the, those who hear the word of God and obey it. And obey it. Believe it. Yeah. It's, it's not necessarily blood relations. Now, this is not, uh, I'm very sensitive right now to socialism and communism. This is not to redefine the family. That's what I really want to talk about if you want some social commentary. But I'll pass right now. Well, uh, God places us in a spiritual family, the church. Yeah. And, um, to an extent that that, that takes priority. Yeah. Rick. Well, I'm just wondering, in, in, the, in light of today and the stuff that we 
see going on in the world and especially the country around us, that last verse 14 should be a rallying cry for every Christian who watches too much news and reacts to everything they hear, no matter what direction the news is coming from, they've got, they, they come rushing out of their house saying, we have to fix this. And I, I'm looking at this again, because I've got a paper in front of me that, I think it's from Martin Luther, but he was talking about the false teachers that this refers to. And it says, you see this daily, the more foolish and unlearned the people are, the bolder and more audacious they are to preach and teach to the whole world. No one knows anything, they alone know it all. So they prepare themselves to make war and revolt against the true saints of God. And I'm sitting here thinking, how many years ago was that written? Five hundred. How true was it yesterday? <laughs> right. Yeah. But the idea is in 14, Christians, before you gather up all of the armament and go, wait. Wait, because nothing is going to disappear that is not part of God's plan. And, no. But I just don't think we do that enough. Nothing's going to put Jesus back into the tomb. Preach it, brother. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's just, hold on a minute. If you're panicked about that the resurrection is going to be undone because this thing has happened, it's not. So, and I think that's where there there is just something. And I, it's not to say there won't be battles that we are, whatever they are, engaged in. But I don't think we ought to go seeking them out, certainly. And there is so much wisdom to stand firm. Just stand, hold the line, hold the line, said William Wallace in Braveheart at the Battle of Sterling. I showed that to the eighth graders. I had to stop the gore, though, because some of them were sensitive to the gore. In Gladiator, when Maximus brings them in to the center, back to back, side to side, as one, in the whole armor of Christ. Well, it's not the whole armor, armor of Christ, but it is a Roman sort of armor stick together because if we splinter apart then we're going to get picked off we're, we're much better and so how do you hold together as one because there's one body the body of jesus christ who is not back in the tomb he is risen wait for the lord he's coming back and because of that i mean verse 13 i believe that i shall look upon the goodness of the lord in the land of the living uh we don't like we will certainly see the goodness of the lord when christ returns but we still get to see that today, too. Um, oh, that I am looking upon? Absolutely. Okay. God has good things for us in this life right now, today. It's not just some someday in, in the future, I mean, which is absolutely true, but we get snippets of that now. Um, we get it. Uh, we get it because Vita's here today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Goodness of see? the Lord. I mean, we just start listing off yeah, all the I mean, all cool the things. All yeah. the good and wonderful blessings that we have in this life are all from God. Those are all the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We are living today. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so all those things, it doesn't even have to be like overtly spiritual thing. It can be just like, Hey, I got yesterday, a third grader gave me a cupcake for his birthday. Goodness of the Lord. In the yeah, land that's of the cool. Living. You get paid to do, have that yeah, job. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Uh, uh, I mean, it can be as simple as that, or it can be when we get to, Go to the altar and receive, this is my body given for you. I believe that this 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 is is the body of Christ. This is my blood shed for you. We get to hold and taste Jesus in the land of the living right now, today. Uh, And so absolutely, there's a future orientation to this, but there's also a present orientation to it as well. Oh, it's it's a now and a not yet. Absolutely. Okay. And... Even though we get to see Jesus, we get to touch and taste Jesus uh, hidden in with and under the bread and wine, uh, which is a great and wonderful thing. But man, can't wait for the day when we actually get to see and hear Jesus with our eyes and ears. We get to touch him. Amy. Um, I have a really foul mouth. I Jesus have, doesn't like that. Join the club. <laughs> Join the club. I also have like anger issues. Like I get so mad about like the littlest, stupidest things, and then I just let it control me to the point where my husband's like, you know, calm down. Like, like Brooklyn didn't get pe- picked up by her um, alliance coach in rec-, rec season as a catcher, and like it ticked me off. Like I'm mad at him. Right. So 
I went and bought Brooklyn $400 worth of catcher's gear, brand new Lutheran High School colors, because that's where she was going next year. And uh, I, her rec ball coach ended up being, uh, his daughter got injured, and uh, she was a catcher for five years, and he's going to teach Brooklyn to catch. But anyway, I got so angry about it, and God was sending us a different blessing. So I just want to say, like, if I would have just waited, I didn't need to do all that. Right. You know, I didn't need to go out and buy the four hundred dollars. I just needed to just be still and let God. The waiting is good for me, and I need to learn to wait better. Yeah, it's easy to get caught up into anything and everything in this world to get anxious or upset or resentful or bitter or fired. I mean, all uh, all this. I mean, it all ends up, as you said, controlling us. We begin become enslaved to these things, and Christ has said, "You, you're free from all that." You're still young. You'll be <laughs> <laughs> I revolved my world. I'm like, no, this isn't happening. She's got the new catcher's gear, and she's going to be the best kid catcher there ever was. Well, it, it is. It is. It. It's a good thing that you love your daughter and you're willing to fight for her on the one hand. But then, and what I think is encouraging this side of the table, to have the humility and honesty to say, wait a minute, this this maybe is getting out of hand. <laughs> uh, Pastor Luke and I have had a lot of conversations about, I mean, it, some and, and many of you, because I don't hold it in very well, the smallest things can tyrannize me. I mean, down to, well, I don't even want to get into it right now, because uh, uh, it, it, is, it is regularly, though, I think, reminding one another, and, and sometimes it's perspective, like, look, maybe we don't want to hear it always, but it's, it's going to be okay. And it, it is having that balance, but it is a good thing to be passionate for and care about your child, but then to realize if this consumes you, ah, look out. Rick's going to preach it, brother. Come on, preach it. He preached about prayer today. I just had to mention, based on what he said, I don't know if any of you ever saw this, but in the new song service one day, we were singing the opening song, and Pastor Troy got up out of the chair in the front row, walked up to the lectern, and pushed it about a half an inch. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, I know a little bit about him. <laughs> No, I was going to say that I, I don't want to condone or excuse. But sometimes I think that it's the it's the fact that you had the bad behavior that you can actually see what God did. Because if you don't ever respond to anything, I'm not sure your heart is always open to seeing what God has done to resolve that. But it seems like if you if you've been angry, if you've given up, if you've lashed out, and then God does something, now you're able to see it more clearly. And the good news about that is that's when we look at that, because I used to tell the kids in, in class, you know, kids today just throw around, oh my God, as if it were a phrase. But then a lot of people will say, oh my God, when they're in big trouble. Or when there's a problem, we angrily say, oh my God. And then suddenly God delivers us from whatever it is, and our, our phrase becomes, oh my God, thank you. And then I think that there's another one after that says, oh my God, I'm gonna praise you because of what you did. And then I think there's sometimes the last one that's kind of like, oh my God, when you realize how good he is and how awful we were. And so you can say it so many different ways, but sometimes I think, I'm not saying God puts the anger in us, but if the anger is there or the or the bad response, I for me it's always easier to see where God is going after I've sat down and go, well I shouldn't have done that. And that I think it helps a little bit. I think the word is passionate. Passionate. <laughs> Rather than because sometimes it's it's not an anger as much as it's just a passion. You're being passionate for your child and you get, you know, get so caught up in wanting to protect them you know, and, and other things too I mean it can be be very passionate about what you're doing and you know thinking do you not understand like even in like band rehearsals and do you not understand how important it is for you to follow the key signature and you know because it just destroys this piece of music when you forget and to be and so you're passionate about what you believe in which turns into, you know, it's just like, oh, maybe they don't understand it the same way I do. You know, 
it, and I, I mean, my experience is, I think in general, I would rather have someone be overly passionate and know they're committed than someone who is so dispassionate that I'm not even sure if they care or are alive. Because at least there's something to work with. It's the apathy of, well, whatever. Uh, and, and I think, and, and from a spiritual perspective, the person, the worst is the person who's lukewarm, who says, I know this isn't right, but I'm not going to do anything different. It's better that they would be dug in saying, I'm going to keep doing this, even though it's not right, but they didn't know something else. Because then there's something to work with. But, but I am... I mean, I can think, Paul, when you're talking about this, too, about, like, the key signature, because that's a poor – it's going to reflect poorly on the leader, too. Because I know I could count on a Paul Johnson-led band will stick, even though I don't know exactly everything about key signatures. But I think, that, like, we're in this together. And let's do, if we're going to do it, let's do it well. That's, that becomes my hang-up because I want to make sure that thing is a half an inch over. It will screw me up. <laughs> uh, and I feel – and this – Well, that's good. See, we're on the same – uh, but I, I, I know that my stumbling block at home, Andrew would say, I am passionate about everything I'm passionate about. I am a, I range anywhere from a nine to a nine and a half out of 10 in intensity. And so it doesn't matter if it's about putting the dishes away. It doesn't matter if it's about wiping the dog's feet off. It doesn't matter if the house is on fire and we need to get out. It is the same level of intensity. <laughs> and, uh, that is not always good for me. Uh, and the people around me. I think, blessedly, my blood pressure is still relatively low, but it's a lot of yelling at Pastor Luke that involves <laughs> that. And I think, uh, speaking of foul language, I mean, Martin Luther does not, he uses a lot of foul language, and Pastor Luke and I don't preach with foul language to you all, to one another, <laughs> every once in a while. Uh, I, and I have talked through, I, I sometimes have to even talk through my worst-case scenarios of what I would like to do in order to look at it and go, yeah, that's pretty stupid. Don't do that. But I have to actually get it out, I've found. And, and, and I, I'm learning that as I've gotten older. Like it may, I shared something with Rick Reed the other day. It wasn't about you. But I think it maybe caught you a little off. I said, what I really would say, no, yeah, I'm not going to do that though. So anyway, enough about me. <laughs> and so court, instead of being so judgmental, like you say Luther was coarse. With his right, yeah, that's yeah, a that's a good foul. euphemism. Be uh, more positive. He's very, very authentic and earthy. Yeah, I was thinking I was thinking earthy. Yeah, so foul implicates that he was just, he was a you know a cussing man, but maybe who read the titles of his work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, was, <laughs> he, was, he was of the people. <laughs> 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 I think, I think David probably used a little, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think there is some sense. God, oh God, what in the heck is your problem? I mean, he says that essentially. And it doesn't mean God's wrong, but help me to understand because I'm really goofed up. And why I parked in front of this school out here for like three months at the beginning of the school year. And then I started to come and then there would be other people parked in front of the pool. And yeah. I'm like, didn't you know the art teacher parked here in front of the pool? So there are little kids that come to the pool every day, and that's where mommy's car will be. So I, I had to start parking somewhere different every day. You're not parking my spot. There's still, uh, yeah, we all have spot. I. That's right. Psalm 27. <laughs> He's passionate about his spot. He yeah. has handicapped spots. Yeah. Uh oh. Uh oh. Wait, I. Wait, we had a fellow in our church when I was a child. He'd always come late. And he'd still watch up in front and sit down. Sometimes the choir would be singing, so he'd gone up, on up, and join the choir. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, that takes some boldness. So Psalm twenty-seven. Yeah. Was oh, that what we were talking about? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, this psalm. There's a lot of good, good things in this psalm, especially for a funeral. Uh, and I think 
the last two verses really hit home for the context of a funeral that uh, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take courage. Wait for the Lord. Uh, that for those who are grieving, um, <clears throat> to wait for the Lord, to hope in the Lord. And our hope is in Jesus, the one who did not stay in the tomb, but rose again from the dead and will raise um, all of us as well. Yeah, amen. That, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> this is the word of the Lord. Uh, any uh, any final thoughts on Psalm 27? You got another psalm today? Yeah. Uh, my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. That's good, like every day. Yeah, in, in the face of all these things, being forsaken by family, enemies, violence, all this stuff, you can, we can still say, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of, in the, land of the living. And in the, the face of the death of a loved one, we can still say, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. Take courage. Wait for the Lord. Well, and it's trusting that the truth, the, the truth will endure. The lie may travel faster, but it will die. But the truth will live and endure. Yeah. And, and that takes patience, though. Hey, I'm going to chase down this lie. Uh, but it's saying, no, the truth will eventually come out. And, that, and that's where in the face of a denial of reality, it may work for a little while. But the truth, because because the the way of the Lord, the level path. I mean, God doesn't change; His will will be done. But it takes faith to trust that. And then we say, "Well, it takes Jesus." Uh, and we're regularly reminding ourselves of that because the panic for me is that, well, no, this one thing will screw it all up. No, it's going to be okay. And I think we see that in the the shifts in David's mood or tone that. He starts off strong, and then he falters, and then he, he comes back like he's reminding himself of what he already knows. And as Christians, we are constantly reminding each other of what we already know. Like, hey, Jesus is still risen from the dead. Like, oh, oh, yes, he is. And he knows who he is not. He's not God. He's not the Messiah. He is a real person. Mm -hmm. And so that's also, I think, a helpful thing. And then it's, so it's good to remind, hey, you know, I've actually got vulnerabilities and quirks. Uh, and those are not what ultimately defines me. Peggy. Verse 12, um, you can really look at that in different ways. Um, you can look at it spiritually. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes. Well, who are the big foes? Sin, death, and the power of the devil. Um, or false witnesses rise up against me. Well, Satan is the father of lies, breathing out violence, which could be, okay, you have this incurable illness, you're going to die, and right. it's all out of God's hands. Well, that's not so. And so that's where 13 and 14 follow along, and that reassurance or and affirmation that nothing, you know, none of those spiritual foes have any power over us. They're empty threats. I mean, we're saying to Satan, you're the father of lies. There is no truth to this. It's empty. It's an empty threat. And then really to, to go Easter, the tomb is empty, Satan. Look at Jesus. Don't You can talk to me all you want. Look at Jesus. You, you're a loser. But like, it's kind of like what IU fans try to do with Purdue fans about look at the five banners, but not as sanctified. Yeah, and I think David is fairly ambiguous as to what is actually troubling him. I mean, he says a couple of things, but... I think the ambiguity is helpful for us because it makes it relatable to right. us, whatever the adversaries or foes that we're facing. I mean, ultimately spiritually, but maybe we're facing real adversaries and foes, um, whatever it might be. Uh, but uh, to be able to relate to, to David's humanity here is in his faith that is strong but weak at the same time. Um, yes, I believe, help my unbelief, all of that. Uh, makes it very, we can connect to it very, very, quite easily. And especially uh, when in the face of death, uh, as you said, Peggy, that, you know, death is our adversary, uh, is our foe, and that 
we can still, in the face of death, still say, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And where do you, where do you specifically go to know what God's will is? To who? who how, well, his will is that the dust will, won't stay dust forever. Mm-hmm. That we look in the face of Jesus Christ, the will of God is that not everyone dies, but that they're saved and come to a knowledge of the truth and that they live. So it it's always going to come back to Jesus. So the will of my adversaries is that I despair, that that I go toward death. But your will, well, the will of the Father is evidenced in the Son. And the Holy Spirit makes sure that we hear and that will is shared and proclaimed. Surely. Um, in the last few days, uh, going downtown a lot and going to see some of my other antique friends in other places, I've been able to start up conversations about um, things because the people that I know and that, you know, I barely know, but I begin to understand them more because I've, we've been able to talk about the fact that people are, that I didn't know, are upset about the things that are going on in the United States, which I think is kind of nice because I get to understand them as people now. And um, I don't know that I would have had the courage or I would have talked to them if these things hadn't happened. And like, for example, I know this is silly, but Pepe Le Pew is being taken off uh, because he is now a, he's being canceled. And in case you wanted to. I was wondering what was canceled this week, so it's good to know. Yeah, but it's opened up conversations for us to talk about the fact that as a Christian, how far do you let this go? You know, how stupid is this or how ignorant or you know at least i get to know their feelings they get to know my feelings and i don't know whether we would have talked about this if it if it hadn't happened who's the other guy they canceled this week speedy gonzalez, speedy gonzalez. Mm-hmm. so you know i'm <laughs> well it's, it's again I mean, it's, it's, had known this we would not have been able to have these conversations about who we are as christians and I wouldn't have known their standpoint, and we wouldn't, you know, and they are like I am, you know, just that's how they feel. And, and, uh, again, we talked about this last week or two weeks, whenever it was. But uh, I can't wait to find out in two weeks what's been canceled yeah, next. Yeah, like, and this stuff bothers us, whatever it might be, in one way or the other. But sure. Who feel like I feel, you know, yeah. that I'm not standing alone in this. Field. In the face of anything and everything that's canceled. The good, we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Like, the canceling of this stuff is not going to put Jesus back into the tomb. Jesus can't be canceled. He Did already you do the Jesus juke? Your sin is canceled. Je- Death Jesus, is canceled. Jesus has already been canceled for our sake. And yeah. we, we really are free. We are free. We don't have to get sucked into all this craziness oh, of the I world. I want to, though. I want to. It, and let it destroy us. I, 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 would, I want to be on a cancel crusade myself. Yeah. Because uh, I think the thing, if you can't, if you don't look into the face of Jesus Christ, then it's, a, well, you know how people are made righteous? By canceling everything. Yeah. And the counter-righteousness is, then you're made righteous by canceling people who cancel. And then you just always focus on canceling everything and you never see Jesus. And that's where the real enemy is not the people who are canceling or uncanceling. The real enemy is Satan yes. in that sense. But he would like to use us to see anyone and everyone as an adversary. <clears throat> cancel, cancel, cancel. And I realize, I get it. I show Pastor Luke little little Twitter videos. I say, you see this? And then, and, and, and you, last night, well, you were there too, Rick, and you, like, you said, you thought, I get invigorated by it. And you, and you, fills me with dread. Fills you with dread. <laughs> oh, it's like, yeah. but for me, I don't have to. I I don't have to be filled with dread because Jesus is still risen. Because I'm not filled with dread. Because I'm, re- and it's not that I want to fight. <laughs> yeah. But I'm like, hey, there are people who really think like this. That's interesting. And I think part of it too about the waiting, and 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 you and I, a, a mentor to us, is is even just thinking about when you encounter something new in your life. It's a question of you know where I'm going with this. Like, hey, what is this versus what the heck is this? Mm-hmm. Right? Because that's what I that's what I said yesterday when I came down here to find the E30 error on the coffee machine. What the heck is this? And whose fault is it? And I got a list of suspects. There's a lot of things as opposed to, huh, I wonder if this thing isn't working right. I wonder what that is. Well, that's a lot of, with my family? Oh my. What is this? Why is this door not shut all the way? Don't you ever listen? I am the greatest door shutter in this household. And none of you know this. And then go down the line. 
this thing is a half an inch over. You know this will ruin everything. <laughs> Jesus is back in the tomb. Yeah. So I, I do this just to hopefully present some of the absurdity of it. Because my natural reaction to things is, what in the heck? And that's the nice way. Yeah. Because it, it's not even the four-letter word you're thinking. Yeah. Put other four-letter words in there. Like, oh, I, I'm easily. I told you I run between nine and nine and a half. I can't. I won't even sleep tonight. But then the coffee machine's not working. Just saying that it has given me the opportunity to discuss with other people my feelings, and I, it gave me great comfort to know they felt like I felt. You know that this was not. You know I'm not alone in all this. In other words, Jesus is is part of their lives as well as part of mine, which I find very satisfying. I, I, I want to get to Rick, but just real quick question, and I and I'm I'm channeling the spirit of what I think Rick Reed, if you've met him. You mentioned your antique friends, and I was just wondering, does that <laughs> uh, I held on to that, because I, I think we may need to cancel that term. Uh, do you mean your friends who deal in antiques, or like they're, okay, all right, well, I just, okay, well, because, because, like, to use that term, we need to cancel that. We don't, canceled, uh, okay. Rick, Rick Kerr, would you count, would you consider yourself an antique? No, so. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just, I'd never heard the term. I was offended, but I wanted to make sure, uh, but I was offended because I think Rick Kerr may be an antique. No, I still, so I just, okay. A crown antique. <laughs> <laughs> a double vaccinated antique. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 know, there's so much anger in this country, and, and <laughs> you, I, I learned, especially in what I did for a living, that you cannot fight anger with anger. It just doesn't. I, I still remember what Richard Nixon said on the day he resigned. And whether you liked him or disliked him, he was talking to this White House staff, and he says, always remember that people don't win when they hate you. They only win when you hate them back. Because when you hate mm -hmm. them back, you destroy yourself. Yes. What comes to mind when we're talking about all of this is obviously everybody is affected by what's going on in the discussion in the country today. And everybody does have opinions, some far more passionate than others. I listen to a wide variety of news trying to get any semblance of some agreement anywhere like that. But when I look at the anger that's going on out there, the thought that always runs through my mind is what is God's will for the people who are causing the things that are making me angry. And then I remember that they come to the knowledge of God through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So no matter how awful I think that other side is, God's on his throne saying what I want them to know about me. You know, I'm not gonna throw a lightning bolt down on them. I want them to live long enough to know about me. And that doesn't mean that everybody on the other side of any argument is not saved. But the idea is if we can look at people, and I think this is true about our immigration <coughs> issue too, regardless of how you want to look at that and get into it, the people who are coming across our border, when God looks at them, what does he think? I want them saved. That's his will. And, and so if I force myself to look at people that way, I don't compromise my doctrine, I don't compromise my beliefs, but I look at what does God really want of them because I want them hurt, you know? I want them to be dealt with, uh, but that didn't stop the Roman soldiers at Calvary. And we don't know God's ultimate will out there. So it's a, it's a pretty difficult issue because we're so convinced that there's going to be, if we don't do something now, then they'll take the next step, which will really hurt us. Well, when you're as old as I am, You've lived through that many times in this in the history of this country. I, most of us, can, many of us, can remember gas lines in 1973, and only being able to go to the gas station on certain days of the week because of some things like that. So, God's will, all all to be saved, and uh, that's got to be my first prayer for them, even though it's not the one I want to say. Well, Saint Paul says our 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 fight is not against flesh and blood, but against the Princip powers and principalities and the, yeah basically the the demonic forces that are are at work in this world and uh and it I, the last couple of weeks i've been trying to teach the seventh graders about loving your enemy and forgiving and turning the other cheek and uh <laughs> it's not going over it's going very well, well. Uh, uh, 
Uh, they don't like that. And of course, none of us do in our, in our natural inclination. We don't, it's not natural for us to turn the other cheek, but as you said, Rick, to, to view the other side and whatever it might be, politics, religion, I mean, the other side of the family, I mean, it could, any, anything. They are a person created by God for so, someone for whom Jesus died right. and someone who Jesus wants to save. Um, and, and that is a humbling thing because I am not that far removed from that person either. Well, I think the alternative is because if it's not true that Christ died for them, and the, the, why is it true that he died for me? Yeah. And, and so I would say we do know God's ultimate will. It is that the the creation is reborn ultimately. We've seen that the future comes into the present in Jesus. So then it is seeing ourselves and others in Jesus. And that's why we can say, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living because Christ is risen. And I can wait for the Lord to be strong and let my heart, heart take courage. Nothing's putting him back in the tomb. Wait for the Lord. Uh, wait for the Lord. Uh, always centered in Christ. But it's good to remind ourselves. And I appreciate the the real rawness here um, j just because we, th this is real life stuff and, and it's fun to be with you. Uh, if Arlene was here, she would tell us we're three minutes over time. Well, close us in prayer. Then. So Ron, that's your, that's part of the family, <laughs> Ron. Uh, yeah. So anyway, I'll pray. Uh, Heavenly father, thank you again that you have gathered us together and for the, the joy of, um, well, we know that we're waiting, and yet we're waiting for something that we know uh, has already happened in one sense, and that Christ is risen, that you have shown the depth of your love, not only for us, but for all of your creation. And so as we live by faith, as we follow Jesus, help us to do so faithfully. Forgive us for uh, our impatience, um, not only with others, but with ourselves, uh, our impatience with you, but also then in the courage and the certainty that we have in Jesus, help us to see others in him, to be uh um, his hands and feet uh, to, to listen, to speak a word of comfort as well. Uh, and thank you again for each person here, for the technology that allows us to connect with others who are not physically here. Um, and Jesus, we're, we're thankful for you, and we can't wait for your return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.